so yes, everyone can take their seats, Jared, would be good for that thing. Okay, great. All right, so welcome everyone, welcome to our monthly meeting for December, our last meeting of 2022. Uh, my name is Emma, President of Gannick of the Gans Association for Um and I'm really happy to be here. So, is anyone else in the hallway? We'll bring a couple more people in, and the last stragglers are coming in. And as people are coming in, if you could please check out the agenda. Everyone look at the agenda. Uh, is there anything that is missing that you all would like to add to our agenda? Yes, yeah, it's, 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 Yeah. So wherever you can hear. All right. Any additions to the agenda? All right. We can always add things if things urgent at the end in our new business. So I'd like to bring Bob Gelber up to introduce our lovely host for this evening. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, so once again, we're being hosted at the New York Historical Society. This is the third time we've been here for some kind of meeting, and we're here because of the graciousness of Kathleen O'Connor. And just to give you a very quick story, uh, Beth Goff worked for many weeks to try and get us to a particular synagogue, which I won't mention, and when they found out that Debbie Applegate was doing a talk on a madam, they felt it was not appropriate for the congregation. <laughs> so we either had to ditch the site or ditch Debbie, and we were not ditching Debbie, we were going to have her. So I immediately emailed Kathleen, and the next day she said to me, I don't think I can get you the library, but we probably can get you a classroom. So in her bio, which is very short, because she doesn't like to say too much, she just said that uh, Kathleen has been the marketing manager here at the New York Historical Society for almost 20 years. She is a friend of Gannick. She's been honored at the Apple Awards. She's presented at the Apple Awards, and we thank her. is on the fourth floor, so Polly doesn't bother us. <laughs> Bring them on. Um, I want to welcome you here. We're always delighted to have you, and I've missed you for uh, like three years, so it's yes. just been awful. Um, next time, hopefully, we can get the library <laughs> and do it in a more civilized way. I just wanted to let you know, um, you've got uh, a flyer about our current and upcoming exhibitions, just so you know. And you've also got my card in case you need anything. I mostly work remotely, but I always get my calls. So if you need anything, just let me know. We have created something special for tourists and professionals. It's a special kind of bonus package that we've created. Um, it does include still uh, free admission but also uh, we are going to give you a 10% discount in our store. Um, so all you have to do if you go in the store, just show your badge. Um, in a few days, you'll get an email from me with a promo code so that you can order online if you want also. Um, I will also be sending out monthly emails with links to blog posts, videos, and audios. We have a huge library that people don't know about because of COVID. So we haven't been able to tell people, but we've got all kinds of blog posts and videos and things that I think would be of use to you. Also, our curators, beginning next year, will be doing uh, exclusive briefings for tourism professionals. Um, they will be presenting information on upcoming exhibitions. We'll do it as a Zoom presentation but it will be recorded, so if you can't make it, you'll get the link. And you can ask questions, you'll find out ahead of time what's going on, um, what are the, the new exhibitions coming up, where's the best place to take a selfie, 
because that's a question we get all the time. Um, so um, that, that'll be coming out. So for all our exhibitions, the larger ones, um, you'll get a briefing. So that'll be really great too. So um, I will let you go on with your meeting, but I wanted to tell you about all these different things that we have in the works. And um, I appreciate getting any feedback from you. So if there are things we're doing that don't work, tell me. If there are things that you would like to see, let me know, because we're very nimble. Besides liking Polly Adler, we are very nimble. <laughs> so uh, we can pretty much do anything. So welcome tonight, and hopefully when I see you next time, it'll be in our glorious library on the second floor. We're changing it. When is it closing? It's not closing, but it's all switching over. And it's more like a permanent yeah. exhibition. So we usually, on these flyers, list um, the ones that are uh, what we call temporary. So they move in and out. The one in Dexter is going to be, it's always art, but about every six months, they're going to change things around. Yes. Kathleen, I noticed that the double hyphen disappeared from New and York. What? And a lot of the signs is just a single hyphen. I will check that out. <laughs> <laughs> in the lobby announcing where you come in the entranceway, it's single hyphen. Oh my God, because I am so proud of that hyphen. <laughs> yeah, because people will always come in. It's a great way to start a conversation. Somebody will come up and say, you know, you spelled it wrong. Why is there a hyphen? Then I get to go back to the Revolutionary Times and how the crazy Brits spelled New York. So I will check that out. Thank you. So take care. Have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. news tonight is cavorting about on the Upper West Side with too much partying. So. <laughs> take our inspiration from <laughs> uh, we'll behave, I promise. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, Kathleen. It's really, it's always a pleasure to be here. And the classrooms are great. I and mean, it's really good to see the other spaces too. So thank you very, very much. All right, so um, I just have a uh, not too long uh, report, just some, some information for all of you. And you can all hear me okay. okay. Yes, all right. So uh, just a couple things, and this is also to go, because also we have some new members who have joined. Um, just a friendly reminder about etiquette on fan tours, okay? First of all, you can cancel ahead of time. Don't make our poor Jeremy crazy. But one thing to keep in mind, you cannot cancel on your phone by using the, um, by going through on your phone. You have to do it from a desktop. I was helping another guide and she's like, but I'm trying to cancel. I'm like, do it at home when you're on your desktop. Okay, so something to keep in mind. Please be on time. Don't keep your guide waiting. They're often prepared for this. So sometimes you're going to a site visit, going to visit a place that has tickets, and you know everyone has to get in at the same time. So please be on time. Be polite. Don't be that guide who's like, oh well, you know, you forgot to mention this, or you forgot to mention that. One of the reasons we do the tours is to practice and to practice in front of the most difficult audience we could ever give a tour to. Um, yeah, giving tours for tour guides is like, it's crazy. If you haven't done it, try it out. Um, but don't be that guide. Don't be the person who's in the back saying, God, this. Are you gonna mention this? Let your gu uh, fellow guide finish their tour. And save the questions for the end. You know, you're, you don't want to be the person like, at the end of the tour. They're like, "Well, I had this guest who just made me crazy." You don't want to be that person. And so, don't be talking in the back. You know, it sometimes is great with our fan tours. You get to see everybody you haven't seen them in a while. But please give your attention to the guide. And then, last but not least, don't forget to tip. You know, it's really appreciated. All of us grouse like mad about not getting tips from guests. You're a guide. How, how could you not tip another tour guide? And first of all, it's just rude. Second of all, it's really bad karma. 
Okay? <laughs> Third of all, like you're just, I mean, just don't. Then you're, you know, they're like, mm -hmm. so and so came on my tour and they didn't tip. What the heck? Just, you know, just no, just don't. Okay, so a little friendly reminder about our fam toys. Another reminder, please don't forget to renew. Okay, the renewal period is through to the first January meeting. Okay, so the date of the first meeting, which is January 7th? I'm trying to remember. Third, is it the third? Okay. So anyway, there our first meeting, our first meeting in January, that's the cutoff date for renewal. You can renew afterwards, okay, that's not a problem, but after January 3rd, if you haven't renewed, or the 4th, after January 4th, if you haven't renewed, you just, you won't have access to the website anymore. And everything will like, you get turned off. And then we just turn it back on once you renew, okay? So please remember to renew. Now, insurance, it, we are still waiting to hear for NFTGA, but it looks yeah, like the- It's gonna be $99. It's still gonna be, it's gonna be $99 for the insurance, but we'll get all the, we'll get more information about it when we have more information that will be communicated to everyone. And our insurance is through NFTGA. And speaking of NFTGA, all right, the um, conference will be taking place in San Antonio, Texas, okay, January 25th through the 28th, okay, and Gannick will be providing uh, tent, uh, members who apply for a stipend with $1,200 to attend the, um, to attend the conference and to give a report to Gannick at the meeting following the conference. So that will be in February, you give a report. John and I were sponsored by Gannick for IATDG. We'll be giving a report on what happened there, what we saw there, but things like that. And so we, you're expected to give a report and to attend as much, um, as many of the sessions, uh, as many of the different um, networking moments and everything as you can, because you're going there to represent Gannick and to report back to the members. So if anyone's interested, you need to email the board by tomorrow. Please email the board by tomorrow, by end of day tomorrow. Um, and just you know, put in the subject line, NFTGA stipend, and explain why you'd like to attend. And um, the board will be uh, going through the stipends the people who've applied at our next meeting, which is on the 18th, I think. 19th. 19th. My dates are just like, I'm sorry, I'm all, all out of it. So that's for um, San Antonio for NFTGA. They're gonna be fan posts, it's gonna be really a lot of fun. Um, John, you just wanted to mention something. As John has attended previous NFTGAs, just wanted yeah, I just you know I know that some people are dubious about or concerned about going to Texas, you know, <laughs> and I don't want to contradict anybody. Like your feelings, like like I am a father. Like I am a father. I am a, a brother. I am a son, and I am a husband, and I have a lot of concern about that issue, and I don't want to. Down. But so there's reasons not to support a state that has a frankly barbaric John, policy convert? of this area. But there are things to support, um, and I just want to mention that because first of all, I think by going to NFTGA, first and foremost, we can support our own Michael Dillinger, who's president of NFTGA. Possibly this is his only run doing this, and it would be great to have his. Because you are chairing it, right? Like you're yes. the, you, you are chairing it. It, it. it would be great to have our own Michael Dillinger have as successful as a conference as it possibly can. And you know, it wasn't entirely your choice that it would be there, I, I believe. And we just I, so I think that's something to support. I think the city of San Antonio is not Texas. It's not the same politics. And I think there's ways to be supportive of that, that and not necessarily supportive of the elements. So I just really want to say, as somebody who's attended that conference twice, it is a, a great experience, and I would hope that Gannick sends a good delegation there. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, and it's important to remind, uh, to remember that you know you're also we're also supporting um, NFTGA, we're supporting other um, tourist association, tour guides association, local guides down there. and local guides. Yeah, local guides in San Antonio. So if you're interested. Um, please um, please apply. And if you go to the NFTGA website, nftga.org, you can find out more information about, it. oh, it's dot .com. .com. Yeah, they're both, uh, I've used ORG too. So anyway, nftga.com, you can find out more information about that. Um, and that's really it from me for now in terms of the credit. Oh, that's right, I mean, the culture card. So, Jeremy. As 
members of WFTGA. All right, so for those two of you who are new, we've got this war, this letter salad that we throw everything out. So GANIC, of course, is Us Guides Association of New York City, NFTGA, National Federation of Tourist Guides Associations. WFTGA is World Federation of Tourist Guides Associations. And then John and I and the mothers were at IATDG, which is International Association of Tour Directors and Guides. There's a quiz at the end. Okay. But anyway, WFTGA, the World Federation, they have what's called the Cultor Card, Tour with a T-O-U-R. And this is used to have free or discount access to cultural sites, primarily in Europe, okay, and overseas. Not so much in the States, they don't really recognize it. This is for the International Association. So everyone should have picked one up. Jeremy has a little box full there. Um, the WFTGA is the World Federation, so different countries and their guides associations belong. Um, here in the United States, so the NFTGA belongs, and so under that, the other guides associations who are members of NFTGA belong. But GANIC is also a standing alone member. We're, we're our own members, um, not just through our national association. So we have the cultural cards. Jeremy has some more. I've got another little stash at home. So everyone's welcome to have one. Okay, and um, I've never seen it work in New York City, but it can't hurt. You just, you know, I, wherever I go, wherever I travel, I bring, I show my guys license and I show any kind of ID I have from any museum or any other association to see what happens. It's not gonna hurt. So this should work, though. This should work at overseas in European museums. So, um, yeah, so that's it. Um, what I'm going to do now is we're going to have our, our guest speaker and be introduced, oh, sorry, Dave. I just wanted to add to what you said. Uh, if you do lapse in your payment, that also means you won't have access to our newsletter guidelines. Oh, yes, that's right. Because guidelines you get, um, the digital copy is online in our document section. So, yeah, you want to, because it looks like we're going to have another guidelines before the end of the year. Don't want to miss that. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Beth Goff, who will introduce um, tonight's speaker. from the uh, agenda that she's pulled a surprise winner for a book about Henry Ward Beecher, which I still have to read. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but aside from that, um, she happens to be my cousin through marriage. And I did not know Debbie until a year ago when I first met her at a, a book event uh, uh, pertaining to the new book that she wrote about Polly, Polly Adler. And what's funny is her husband, Bruce, who's my cousin, uh, I'd seen him once, like when we were junior high or something. So, you know, it, it was just a funny coincidence that on Facebook, Bruce puts out, oh, this book about Polly Adler is going to be printed or published in November. And I was like, Polly Adler? Right, she's one of, my, one of my topics for one of my tours. So this is just a weird coincidence. So anyway, I, this is just my personal thing, which makes it even cooler, because Polly is one of my favorite characters in, in New York. It, she's just such a great... Uh, she has like fingers going to all parts of the city uh, in the early part of the 20th century, so she's a great figure in New York. Um, so I'm not going to talk anymore, but I will say, aside from, you know, just the full surprise, uh, <laughs> Debbie was nominated for an Apple Award too, so I just want to throw that out. So, <laughs> so anyway, so come on up, Debbie, and fill us in about that. one of the great pleasures uh, to get to know a family member through this book. Uh, you don't always get the bonus of that. <clears throat> uh, it is also a tremendous privilege uh, to be here, first of all, the New York Historical Society. For my first book about Beecher, I spent a lot of time up in that library. Sadly, they did not have quite as many books about, and I'm just going to say it, whores and gangsters uh, here as they did about uh, Protestant ministers. <laughs> um, so it, I have not been back uh, quite a while. Um, and in, in particular, to be here speaking to this 
illustrious group. I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is. Uh, when Beth asked me if I would come here, I would say, you guys are my people. Um, so I hope that this pleases you. Um, when I first wrote my last book, uh, uh, it was about, uh, if you, if you probably all know because uh, you are tour guides. Um, one of the first major mega churches is here in New York City, uh, Plymouth Church in uh, Brooklyn Heights. It was a tremendous pleasure to write that book. I love the feeling, I'm sure as you all do, of taking a time machine back in, uh, into the world and so it was a great joy. Um, but it was a very different book. I did have all the things we used to say you don't talk about in polite company, uh, sex, politics, and religion. Now I'm not sure there is such a thing as anything we don't talk about or even polite company. Uh, but it was clearly a bigger deal than I realized to go from ministers to madams, uh, from, from would-be saints to unrepentant sinners. Uh, of course, with Polly Adler, as you may have discerned already, we are really entering the dark underbelly of American history. Now, that is not how Polly herself would have liked to tell it. She preferred <coughs> to cast herself as a modern Horatio Alger hero. Um, as she once put it, a cynical person might say that my life has been a typical American success story. From my arrival at Ellis Island, up the ladder, rung by rung, $5 a week, $10 a week, $100 a week, a mink coat, uh, a better address, from a neighborhood trade to an international clientele, from a nobody to a legend. Well, there is some truth to that self-flattering portrait. Um, Polly's speakeasy with a harem, as she liked to call it, uh, was more than an oasis of illicit sex. Her Manhattan brothels, which were scattered all over Midtown, uh, the Upper East Side, and especially the Upper West Side, so it's especially fitting to be here, um, were impromptu salons of a sort, where the highbrow and the lowbrow happily mingled. Is it, if it's all right, I'm just gonna drop this on the floor. Sorry, that's, uh, it's a scattershot. Uh, she, as she put it, from the parlor of my back, from my house, I had a backstage three-way view. I look, could look at the underworld, the half-world, and the high. Slumming intellectuals, Broadway bohemians, newspaper reporters, all were amused by her blunt realism and her louche wisecracks. Many in the underground gay community, both male and female, found her parlor a, a retreat where they could relax and let down their hair and be themselves. Executives in the new fields of radio, uh, motion pictures, and advertising employed her girls to woo clients and customers. Wall Street traders, one of her biggest clientele, of course, um, passed along tips on their way to the bedroom. Uh, racketeers used her parlor as a place to confer with judges and politicians out of the public eye. Entertainers of all kinds knew that they had hit the big time if they could afford a night with one of Polly's girls. And crooked cops made her place their home away from home, which was a decidedly mixed blessing. And everyone, from Park Avenue aristocrats to Lower East Side hooligans, appreciated her ironclad discretion. Now, if you had met Polly on the street, you would never have guessed that she was a fallen woman. She was tiny, like many immigrants of that era. Uh, she was barely five feet high in her tallest shoes. She had a little Cupid doll face. Um, her jewelry was known to be a tad showy, and she had a well-known weakness for mink coats, uh, but no more so than any uh, respectable Manhattan gold digger. Uh, Pearl, as she was named by her parents, was born in 1900, more or less. She was never totally sure what year she was born. Um, it was, she was born in a small town of Shtetl in the Pale of Russia, in what is now Belarus. She was like, uh, if you're familiar with the stories of Shalom Aleichem, uh, the, which were the sources for uh, Fiddler on the Roof, she has a lot in common with those daughters. She was very clever, very self-possessed. She was eager to shake off the confines of her small town life, to see the world, to make something of herself. Uh, in the older sense of the word, we, but they might have used the Yiddish word mensch, the idea of being a somebody, a somebody, in, as we would say in America. 
Her family, very unusual for this time, supported her ambitions. That was not at all common for a girl in this era. Uh, but as the old Yiddish saying goes, man plans and God laughs. <laughs> When Polly was 13, uh, her family decided that they were going to move to the golden land of America. Um, but, but the problem was, of course, it, it took more money to move a, such a large family all at once. So they decided they would send the children, or send the whole family in installments, as she liked to put it. Uh, and she was the oldest, so she was the first to go. She arrives in Ellis Island in December of 1913. She's about 13 herself. She, uh, instead of going to stay with family, she is instead sent to stay with friends of her father's who live up in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, people she really didn't know at all. Uh, landsmen uh, is the Yiddish word for it. Um, now then, it seems like everything's gonna go just fine. Her family's gonna come in a few months, uh, start following behind her. But then tragedy strikes. World War I breaks out. All of a sudden, there is no more travel from Russia or anywhere else in Europe. Polly is essentially stranded among strangers. She's forced to quit school and take a job in one of Springfield's many paper factories. She's now making $3 a week, working six and a half days a week. She is miserable and poor and lonely. So finally, at the age of 15, she decides she is going to try her luck in Brooklyn, New York, where she has some cousins. She did not have much money. She does not have much education or home life, but when she gets to Brooklyn, uh, the, the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn, she discovers freedom. Uh, she throws herself into the thrills of the Brooklyn street life, promenading on Pitkin Avenue, uh, going to all the Brooklyn dance halls, which are now featuring that hot new music of ragtime. Uh, she falls in love with Coney Island, above all. She didn't know it then, but this would be the great turning point of her life. There is a wise guy question uh, that um, probably every woman in this room has heard. Um, many of you have probably asked it. If you were in the sex trades, you have definitely heard this question. Uh, everyone has been asked it at least once. And that is, of course, what is a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? Polly hated that question. Uh, as, as she always said, it's none of your goddamn business. Uh, and she was always very cagey on the subject of how she went from being a good Jewish girl to becoming um, a pro well, she doesn't want to even admit that she became a prostitute, to becoming a madam, she says. She kind of skips over the, uh, the entry phase of things uh, at the age of 19. And she does offer some explanations. There were traumas along the way. Uh, she is date raped by her boss at the corset factory where she <coughs> works. Um, she becomes pregnant by him. Um, when he refuses to marry her, uh, she has an illegal abortion, which is extremely common at that time. Uh, who knew it would come back in, <laughs> in style? Um, she loses her job. Um, she is now kicked out of the house by her cousins, who see her sort of falling apart. Nonetheless, I think it is still hard to understand or explain how she made that transition if you have not really experienced that kind of loneliness, that kind of poverty, the, those feelings of powerlessness and hopelessness. But, like many young women in her position then and now, she decides it's it starts to seem to her that selling sex is going to be the path to a new life, one that had includes pretty clothes and plenty of cash and, and camaraderie among other people in the same position. It starts to seem a little like a sign of smarts, uh, a badge of honesty, maybe even a badge of honor in a rotten world that doesn't give a damn about. So she opens her first brothel in 1920 uh, in a two-room apartment across from Columbia University. Um, this is the same year Prohibition takes effect. Um, I don't know how much she planned uh, on the Columbia connection, but it was at a time when it was all male. Her, her, her brothel was right where Butler Library is now. Uh, whether she had done the marketing research or not, it clearly worked. 
Uh, within two years, uh, she has saved enough money to quit the business uh, and open a little dress shop. Um, it is, it she quickly though decides legitimate business, not for her. Um, frankly, she had become addicted to the high profit margins that prostitution offered. This is an era, remember, when the average white man makes about $3,000 a year. Um, the average white woman, if she's working outside of the house, would be making about $1,500. Polly is soon pulling in $60,000 annually, uh, which is about a million bucks a year. And remember now, she's only like 21, 22. Um, for the first time, it's not just that, it's, it's not just the money, it's also the feeling of having power over her circumstances in a way that's almost impossible to imagine in any other circumstances. So in 1923, she sells the shop on West 93rd uh, and goes back into the flush trades. Now this is another fateful turn. Uh, she is picked up by, uh, taken up, uh, mentored, if you will, by the gambler Arnold Rothstein. If you are a sports fan, you might know Arnold Rothstein as the man who was the gambler who was accused of fixing the 1919 Black Sox World Series. Probably guilty. Uh, if you are a musical theater fan, he uh, his fabulous floating crap games inspired the musical Guys and Dolls. Um, if you watched uh, if you watched uh, Boardwalk Empire, he plays a big role there. Um, pa uh, Rothstein introduces her to all of the big up and coming uh, bootleggers of the time, including rising big shots, names that we would all know like Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Lex Diamond. Polly's house soon becomes a favorite spot of the bookies and the bootleggers who are looking to blow their ill-gotten gains. So all of this makes Polly more ambitious. I had always told my girls, if you have to be a prostitute, be a good one, as she puts it. Well, the same applied to me. If I had to be a madam, I would be a good madam. So now, she says, I was determined to be the best goddamn madam in America. Now she can't advertise like a legitimate business, and of course there is no internet then. So she has to master alternative forms of publicity. Um, her biggest, uh, her biggest trick, and it really, really worked, was to go out to all the better speakeasies and nightclubs that are just mushrooming everywhere in New York City with a whole posse of her best-looking girls all dressed up, so that they would go from speakeasy to speakeasy, nightclub to nightclub. People, men would literally follow them to the next nightclub or follow them back to the brothel. She also had cards made up. Uh, you can see them in the book. I'm sorry. I'm going to bring a book um, that uh, the, there's no name on it, just a parrot, a little red parrot for Polly, and a phone number. And you would call and get, remember, old fashioned answering services. Uh, and then they would connect you up with her because she was always on the move. Um, so that really works. Uh, it's a way of showing off her wares. She also starts cultivating reporters and gossip columns. This is the great era, gossip columnist. This is the great era of the gossip column. Uh, Walter Winchell, for example, becomes one of her oldest and steadiest clients and a good friend. They don't put her name into print, but they spread her name by word of mouth. So all of this works like a charm. She becomes um, a little like the Forrest Gump, if you will, of the early 20th century, of the Roaring Twenties. She turns up in all kinds of cultural hotspots. Uh, she becomes deeply in involved in the world of uh, show business and Tin Pan Alley. Uh, she counts entertainers uh, like Milton Berle and Desi Arnaz and John Garfield and Duke Ellington, Fats Waller, George Gershwin as customers and friends and, and all the rising men who are, and women, some of women, who are going to become the big hot shots of Hollywood in the next couple of years. She entertained many of the great athletes uh, of this golden age of sports. She is a favorite hostess of the Yankee Stadium and Madison Square Garden crowds, uh, and coasts of great names like Jack Dempsey, who she did not care for, uh, and uh, Joe DiMaggio. She is such a good hostess that uh, it was said that when Joe DiMaggio complained that her silk sheets uh, were no good for him because his knees kept slipping, she went right out and got him good plain old American cotton sheets, because that's the kind of hostess she was. 
Her brothel becomes the hot after hours clubhouse for the wits and authors and uh, journalists and actors who gather at the Algonquin Hotel for lunch, the famous Algonquin Round Table. Uh, some of her best friends include what we would now call cultural influencers like Dorothy Parker and Robert Benchley and George S. Kaufman. Um, we are not that far, in fact, from uh, Kaufman's, who was one of her earliest clients from that era. He used to meet, he had a, uh, a uh, arrangement where he would meet a girl under the uh, lamp at 70, West 73rd and Central Park West and bring him back, bring her back to her pied de and send her along as if he had just picked her up and no money exchanged hands, he just would pay at the end of the month. Uh, their stamp of approval brings the big money men in from Madison Avenue, Park Avenue, Wall Street, Broadway, Hollywood. She soon counts genuine American aristocrats like Jock Whitney, Winthrop Rockefeller, um, the Vanderbilt boys as her clients, and customers and friends. But of course, um, as I'm sure you probably know from your own business, the big bread and butter of her business was conventions and business meetings. Uh, Midtown Manhattan, of course, was then the center of the flourishing party girl racket uh, that catered to all the expense account men who, uh, you know, who used easy women to grease the wheels of commerce. Uh, Polly becomes the leading provider of professional party girls. Um, this spent, I spent some time thinking about this because, of course, I, I you know, uh, there were many shocking things in this book, but trying to get my head around is just how common the, the mixing of business, legitimate business and prostitution was, it was, it was remarkable. Um, it was, you know, back then, uh, salesmen, account executives, anybody who had customers like that were all expected to have what they called a stud book, um, we might we might call it a little black book, um, that was filled with the phone numbers of women who were considered, the phrase they always use is, good sports. Uh, I think what they really mean is amateur nymphomaniacs. Um, so what they would do is, as, as the uh, ad man turned novelist Sherwood er Anderson put it, you would sit around drinking with your potential clients. At a certain point, people would be drunk enough that somebody would say, hey, how about some women? Uh, so you would make a couple phone calls, and then they would all find themselves in an apartment uh, with a bunch of women with the money often exchanged so discreetly or on credit that many times they didn't even know that they were in a whorehouse or that the girls were getting paid. Um, you, a more modest, so I spent a lot of time, as I say, thinking about this, and I realized that really the modern version of this is like going to a strip club, which uh, still, of course, happens all the time. Um, I am sure that is not part of your usual tours, but it could be. Uh, the psychologist, so it, it's a way when, you know, business will go to strip clubs to bond. The psychologists call this the power of shared transgression. Uh, rebelling against the rules, indulging in forbidden delights together, and getting away with it together. It can create um, a sense of instant camaraderie and a delicious feeling of secret power. As one auto industry salesman explained bluntly, you get a bunch of guys together in a room who don't know each other, you get drunk, you look at naked women together, and the next day you're great friends. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, of course, that bond was laced with something a little more sinister, as one, as one CEO explained. The point is that I know that the buyer has spent the night with a prostitute that I have paid for. Uh, in most cases, the buyers are married with families, it sort of gives me a slight edge. Well, we will not call it exactly blackmail, uh, but a subconscious edge over the buyer. It's a, it's a weapon that I hold. So Arnold Rothstein also introduces Polly to an army of crooked, crooked police and politicians. Uh, and truly, this probably was the, the biggest shock, how truly corrupt uh, the political system of the 20s and 30s was here in New York City. Uh, it makes anything you hear now in the New York Times or the New York Post look like child's play. So she becomes known famous in the, in the NYPD for her generous bribes to the vice squad and her wild parties where gangsters mingle with politicians and judges and cops. New York's playboy mayor, Jimmy Walker, was one of her most valued customers and a good friend. One critic summed up the charges against Polly this way. 
She provided a liaison between the underworld, politics, the professions, big business, and desirable women. Judges' tips were bartered in her plush parlor. Racketeer labor bosses uh, and labor bosses formulated deals there. Police officers were broken or made, and candidates for public office gained or lost party support as a result of conferences held at Polly's place. So now here I'm gonna stop and warn you that we have come to what I consider to be the most controversial point in Polly's story. So over the years, Polly would come to be, uh, count some of the most powerful men in America as her customers, precisely because she was so good at keeping secrets. But near the end of her life, when her health was beginning to fail, her mind was dwelling on the past, she made a shocking confession to a young friend who, um, whom I interviewed much decades later when he was in his 80s. According to this friend, Polly, out of the blue, confessed that Franklin D. Roosevelt had been one of her clients around the time that he ran for governor of New York. She didn't explain very much about it, except to say, and this is his quote, that she was being taken care of for the rest of her life by the contributions of Democrats. Uh, see, not everything bad happens in Texas. Uh, so, <laughs> you can imagine how surprised I was by this story. I had never, I knew that politicians of all kinds, senators, congressmen, all kinds of people, Huey Long was one of her uh, people, uh, that, you know, I knew that. Uh, but I, and I, she was that proud as all heck about uh, Jimmy Walker, but this, I had never heard anything like this. I literally jumped out of the chair when I was on the phone. Um, and I spent, many, many, many hours uh, trying to figure out if this could possibly be confirmed. So I should say right off the bat that I was never able to, to absolutely confirm it uh, definitively. However, I did find lots of circumstantial connections between Polly and FDR. Um, and it, frankly, this is one of the less savory parts of the book, but it is also the less savory but kind of fun part of my job, um, being a nosy body, essentially. Um, it was so it was now known, for example, that Roosevelt loved an old-fashioned stag party uh, with all of the trimmings. He threw it one for his birthday every single year, including when he was in the White House with, with everything you can imagine at a stag party. Um, amends only. Uh, and despite his illness, Roosevelt was as apparently capable of enjoying sex, even with women who were not his wife. Uh, the eminent newspaper publisher Dorothy Schiff recounted a conversation with Roosevelt's doctor about whether, and this is the quote, whether the president was still potent, as she put it. Obviously, this is pre-HIPAA laws, because the doctor was like, well, sure. Yes, says the doctor, don't forget, only his legs are paralyzed. Uh, and she says, wait, 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 how does he do it? <laughs> Again, no, no HIPAA laws. Uh, and she has somewhat naively, and the doctor says, well, the French way. Uh, and as we were talking about earlier with some people, the French way was, and I'm sorry, here again, I uh, hope you're not offended, that is essentially a fellatio, uh, oral sex, um, which was a sexual practice that was not practiced among women who were not prostitutes uh, in America at that time. Um, so okay, I'm gonna pause again. Um, this is why they didn't want me uh, at the synagogue, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> they didn't even know that this was where we were going, but this is, um, so thanks for your tolerance. You're very broad-minded, obviously. Um, so I'm gonna pause again here. This sordid story is a, is a good reminder uh, that as Polly would be the first to say, being a madam was not a glamorous uh, profession. No matter how much money or power or celebrity was involved, prostitution is a dangerous, difficult, physically and mentally demanding business. Alcoholism, drug addiction, physical abuse, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, suicide are all common occupational hazards. And for 25 years, Polly was looking over her shoulder constantly for double-crossing cops, for undercover investigators, for blackmailers and, and sociopathic customers. Uh, 
when she thought of all the bribes she paid, which amounted to probably about half of her income over the course of her career, uh, and the beatings she took from all the coked up gangsters, and, and probably worst of all, the hypocrisy of her so-called respectable customers, more than once she would say it made her blood boil. But that was the secret to her success, her ability to take it on the chin without squawking and then get back up with a smile on her face. As she liked to say, to an outsider, it may appear that Polly Adler has gotten confused with Pollyanna. I can only say I am one of those people who just can't get a help getting a kick out of life, even when it's a kick in the teeth. So this Pollyanna attitude is put to the test in the 1930s. Now this is when the crash comes, the depression sets in, the national mood changes, even here in New York City. All of a sudden, all of those crooked politicians, all those glamorous bootleggers, they no longer seem so fun or funny or amusing. Um, Polly's underworld power brokers are now being targeted by powerful federal and state investigations. And whether or not Governor Roosevelt was, in fact, Polly's customers, he certainly, she certainly was very much on his radar when he began to run for president in 1932. So now Polly's hard-won notoriety is a liability. She gets swept up into the nets of these investigations. By 1931, the newspapers are referring to her as the female Al Capone, which I think might be a little exaggerated, um, but the first lady of the underworld, that was true. Uh, that's another one of her many, many nicknames, you know the Purple Crest. Um, when the pressure goes too hot, she goes on the lam to Miami and Havana. And she is in fact, wily enough to come through this crisis relatively unscathed. And to her surprise, when the storm finally passes, she discovers that all of this newspaper notoriety has only uh, in burnished her reputation among the swells of what they now were calling cafe society. In fact, her business is doubling um, at this stage. She is powerful enough to escape prison until 1935, when she's swept up in the hunt for the gangster Dutch Schultz, who has been using her apartments as a hideout while he's on the run for tax evasion. Her trial in 1935 causes another huge media frenzy, uh, but through the aid of her friend Lucky Luciano, she was sentenced to only one month in jail uh, with uh, five days off for good behavior. Uh, and that was back when the women's, as you may, many of you may know, uh, the Jefferson Market Library was the women's courthouse and there used to be a prison right, right next to it. Uh, so you could kind of, you could go down a wave at your, your girlfriends uh, when they were up there. Through. Um, when she gets out of jail, for the first time now, she's really seriously thinking about the idea of retiring and quitting the business. And, and for good reason. She is increasingly paranoid for good reason. Um, her pride, her nerves are shot. J. Edgar Hoover has personally directed the FBI to try to find something on her. Uh, the new mayor, Fiorella LaGuardia, has determined that he is going to drive her out of the city. Yet even when she rebuilds her savings and has enough money that she really could retire, she hesitates. She had seen enough of human hypocrisy to know that in the square world, she would be just another nobody or, or worse. As she puts it, as Miss Polly Adler, the reformed, procurous, and honest citizen, I was a social outcast. As Madame Polly, proprietress of New York's most opulent bordello, society came to me. So she continues on through the fat cat years of World War I, excuse me, World War II. But by 1945, now she really is ready to look around for an exit plan. So back in 1930, uh, Abe Lastfogel, the famous uh, boy genius of the legendary William Morris Talent Agency, had urged her to write her memoirs. Uh, at the time, however, nothing could have been less appetizing. Uh, the tabloids would have paid a pretty penny for it, but that would have just about covered the cost of her funeral. 
Uh, but as the years went on, the idea of becoming an author, like so many of her friends, starts to appeal more and more to her. I mean, dozens of mugs with no more education, no more, uh, you know, no more smarts than she has have turned stories of gangsters and gold diggers into best-selling books and hit movies. Why shouldn't she? So in 1945, she finally closes up her house in Manhattan and moves to California, where so many of her old pals now live. She goes back to high school, gets her high school degree. She enrolls in junior college and gets her associate's degree. And finally, after she would be thrilled that you clap, that was one of her proudest thing. Uh, finally, after seven years and scores of rejections by every single publisher, prudish publisher in New York City, in 1953, she finally publishes her memoir, um, House is Not a Home. You are all too young to remember it. You probably were a little kid and it was like on a high shelf. <laughs> Yeah, oh yes, and it, right, exactly. So, so, so uh, in the book is a huge bestseller. I mean, instant bestseller. Uh, it goes on to sell two million copies, which would delight me. Uh, the story uh, is whitewashed, of course. There's a lot she couldn't tell. Uh, but this backstage chronicle of the early sexual revolution and the secret role that illicit sex played in business and politics, it is a huge eye-opener for millions of readers. Uh, if we give, if we call the 1950s the age of conformity, she gives this age of conformity a shocking jolt on par with her fellow authors of 1953, Alfred Kinsey, Simone de Beauvoir, and Hugh Hefner. Uh, <laughs> as it happens, she became a very good friend of Dr. Kinsey's, uh, and she read and approved heartily of both the uh, sexual behavior in the American female, his Kinsey report on women, and uh, Beauvoir's, say, de Beauvoir's second sex. Unfortunately, try as I might, I could find no comment that she might have left on the newly founded Playboy magazine. Uh, probably didn't realize what a big deal it was gonna be. Uh, she was not without regrets, but when pressed, she was unrepentant. In 1961, she sold the film rights uh, to uh, House Is Not a Home to Hollywood producers, but she did not live to see the in delicious irony of Joan Crawford, Barbara Stanwyck, Ethel Merman, and her good friend Martha Ray all scrapping to play Manhattan's uh, number one madam on the silver screen. I think not only would she have loved it, I think she would have probably considered it maybe the very proudest moment in her long career. In the end, uh, if you have seen it, you will know uh, the role went to Shelley Winters, whom you might remember, a, a kind of zoftic, 40-something blonde Oscar winner. She had actually played prostitutes a couple times, so even though she looks nothing like Polly, uh, they, they went with her. Um, you can see the movie on YouTube. It is terrible. I, I don't know, did yeah, you, you I'm saw it? Kid, yeah, yeah you, were, you were a kid, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> what was your mother thinking? No, 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 you just went to the movie. <laughs> Yeah, and in fact, it's you know the problem is it's in, in the early '60s in the Hollywood are more like the '50s than they are like it's not yet the Bonnie and Clyde era. You know, we're not up to the late '60s, so it's really you know it's a terrible movie. Um, it does have a few things going for it, however. Um, the famous costume designer Edith Head uh, was nominated for an Academy Award for it. The title song by Burt Bacharach uh, became a top 100 hit, sung by Dionne Warwick. Um, and the actress Raquel Welch made her film debut as one of Polly's stable of girls. When Polly dies of lung cancer in 1962 in June, long respectful obituaries appeared in papers across the country. It was, it was truly remarkable how many, almost every single paper in the country ran her obituary. They hail her as a symbol of a decadent, long gone era. To her admirers, her brothel was an intoxicating playground for madcap modernists and cutting edge capitalists, all in hot pursuit of, of new and exotic pleasures. It was a space where the imagination was allowed free reign, um, unfettered by outside eyes and conventional rules. In turn, her customers and even some of her uh, workers, if you will, uh, her employees turned these experiences into fodder for uh, books, the songs, movies, books, plays, and all those daring new notions that come to define popular culture of the mid 20th century. To her foes, however, 
Polly exerted a sinister influence with powerful men uh, it, whose after dark decision making affected millions of Americans. If we believe her claim that FDR was one of her, uh, the woman that she procured women for FDR, and that her discretion was critical to his election to the presidency, then her significance was even greater than her critics feared. Publishing a best selling book, of course, boosted her legacy. As one journalist observed, after all of Polly's corruption of both men and women, when she cashed in her chips, what did the obituaries read? Of course, author dies. <laughs> uh, now, while I was working on this book, as you can imagine, um, I thought a lot about The Great Gatsby. I reread it uh, many times, uh, that great American novel of the jazz age. Uh, unfortunately, if Polly ever met F. Scott Fitzgerald or read Gatsby, uh, she left no record of it. But I can say for sure that at least one of her responses would have been a little bit of disbelief. Uh, I don't think she would have found Gatsby's romance with Daisy very convincing. Um, reverence towards women was not a common trait among the bootleggers that she knew. Um, undoubtedly, I think she would have had some uh, very serious practical questions about how you host a massive house party every uh, weekend. What do you do with all that dirty laundry and all those dirty dishes? But the struggles of Jimmy Gatz as he transformed himself into Jay Gatsby, the um, quote, heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as Fitzgerald put it, would have been hauntingly familiar to her. When Fitzgerald began his novel in 1923, he drew inspiration very specifically from some of Polly's gangster friends, and very, very specifically from a chance meeting with Arnold Rothstein, who he turns into the character Meyer Wolfshot in the book. Nonetheless, I, I found it odd that it was Polly who brought to life Gatsby's Fitzger Fitzgerald's fantasy, really, of that wild party as a vehicle for, for pursuing the American dream. Like Gatsby, she turns the cult of the party, that jazz age, that jazz age obsession, into a ladder to climb out of the gutter and into the upper rungs of society. And yet, you know, she really wanted to be remembered. She really wanted to be remembered. She was passionate about her pursuit of posterity. And yet, despite that, it is not Polly. Um, but her male criminal colleagues who became 20th century cultural icons. Prohibition enshrined the gangster as an American archetype, whose lordly ambitions and tragic flaws are considered essential to understanding our national character. Um, when I taught at Yale, undergraduates at Yale, there was one class where they had to watch all three of the Godfather movies back to back, which I'll tell you what, influenced their thinking for later years. You would find it not, and not for the better. Um, but so there, it, now we, we, we think of the gangster as one of our true American figures that we have to understand to understand ourselves. But there is no corresponding myth of the female outlaw who uses sex as her weapon against the world. The Scarlet Woman, as Horatio Alger tale, has never grabbed the American imagination the same way the Rum Runners and uh, the Racketeers did. So I, I spent a lot of time you know, asking, why not? Why not? It's not because we don't know uh, about them. There, there's nothing written about them. In fact, one scholar estimates that there are over a billion pages that have been written about prostitution in all of its aspects. And it's certainly that they're not colorful because they are many great stories. I finally came to conclude that it's probably because Polly's version of the story exposes the dark reality behind our gauzy dreams. In particular, she reveals how often those freewheeling flappers, those cafe society glamour girls, are really sad young women being paid to provide somebody else's pleasure. Sex workers in general, and Polly in particular, are dealers in illusion. The illusion of intimate connection between strangers, of desires without limits or consequences, of spontaneous ecstasy on command, or whatever else the human id can dream up and pay for. Polly's mastery of this mysterious art was the source of her significance, and it contributed in no small part to the glorious legend of the Jazz Age. 
but Americans have little appetite for examining the dreary mechanics behind the spectacle of our dreams. For that reason, despite her quest for fame, Polly hid far more of her story than she ever shared, even from herself. So if Polly has not received her historical due, it is in part because she is a symbol whose reality contradicts the very myths that make this era so glamorous and enticing. And as she herself would say, that is a very hard sell. Uh, but that may be changing. Anyone, of course, who follows the news reports uh, about the Me Too movement, who reads about Jeffrey Epstein, Andrew Cuomo, Harvey Weinstein back in the news again, um, to name only the tip of the iceberg, knows that there is a vital new interest in exposing the intersections of sex and power and dismantling the silence that protects power pe powerful people from bearing the full cost of their desires. So maybe now, if I could say in closing, um, if I might quote Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard, perhaps now Polly is ready for her close-up. So thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you wanted to leave a moment or two for questions. I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, let me also say, um, because you guys are my people, if anyone would like to email me, I, you can, I have a website. You can also take my email address, which is applegate at rainmakerthinking.com. Uh, I'm happy to, happy to be in touch. Um, and I saw a question, Kevin. Yeah. Um, I'm anxious to read the book. Uh, and so uh, I have just two questions. One, your book actually reminded me, I, I'm curious about the inspiration of this coming off of the Henry Ward Beecher because it's almost like looking on the opposite ends of the telescope because of all of the scandals at the end of I see you know your New York history. Yeah. Well, I mean, were you inspired to like turn to how, or that, like, what do you see the relationship of the, those two projects? Well, yeah, that's right. Actually, no one, funny enough, no one has ever really asked me that. Um, well, one thing is I think I am interested in how much that, so, you know, I, I came of adulthood during the Clinton years, and, you know, I'm sure many of you, whether you liked Bill Clinton or not, you, you certainly thought, what the hell are you doing? You're the most powerful man in the world, and you're throwing your career away for this cheap sex. Uh, and I think there is always something that, that surprises me about how much power sex has and how much it is a hidden lever uh, that we don't really realize. So that might be part of it. I would say, though, it was a little more simple. It, it, as many of you probably know who have written books, it is a, it's very tiring and hard to write a book. And I was never going to do it again. Uh, but it turned out winning the Pulitzer Prize, ooh, maybe I should. Uh, <laughs> and literally, that, and I thought, so you know, I'm going to take a time machine. Where would I want to go? And I thought, oh, I know, I don't want to go back to the American Renaissance. Those Calvinists were fun, but not as much fun. Why don't we go to the Jazz Age? It was a dumb idea, because uh, it was much bigger. It took 13 years, which was really dumb. Uh, so I don't recommend that, but uh, yeah, it turns out the very different. Question, I was thinking about this like female agency and not being equivalent to the gangsters and everything. And the one person I kept thinking about when you were talking about Polly Adler was Mae West. And I'm yeah. very curious if they ever intersected with one another. Almost certainly they did. I could never find them quite together. But Polly's main brothel just torn down last year, which killed me. Um, uh, we were going there with a New Yorker, a reporter from the New York Magazine, and we show up and it has just been torn down. Um, but uh, so, we, so there's a little block. If you guys are tour guides, you'll know this. It's like the, the last of the speakeasy era is being torn down in Midtown, of course, all, all with the new skyscrapers everywhere. Um, but there's a little block between uh, Broadway and Sixth Avenue, sorry, Broadway and Seventh Avenue, um, the little, little crowd, corner block. Um, it has the, the hotel, the Harding Hotel, which was owned by Rothstein and Legs Diamond. Um, and was known as a nest of, of chorus girls and bootleggers. Um, and uh, Mae West's mother ran it for a while. Mae West was very good friends with um, Oni Madden, who was one the, the guy who ran nightlife in New York City. And, and that, Polly's brother was right next to it. Um, and uh, so she would often send people over there. All, many of her friends lived there. So it's, and she knew like, nightlife intimately so almost certainly they did know her but and of course 
May West, May West's greatest plays, or very first play, Sex, was inspired by a prostitute, and the prostitution is about a prostitute. So there was just always overlap, but boy, I mean, I, I was constantly trying to fit people into her house all the time. I just went with the ones I could at least have some, uh, some proof of. Uh, which, sorry, which street is it? It's fit West 54th, between, uh, I wanna say, Sorry, you know better than us. Is yeah, it six or is it seven? It's, it's Broadway and seven. It's Broadway and seven. You know, it's, where the, it's where the Oyster Bar restaurant was. It's where what? It's where that Oyster Bar restaurant yeah. was. Yes, oh, there is right now a little bar in what was the Club Abbey where, if you know uh, Judge Crater, was uh, the famous Judge Crater story, It's it's there's a little tiny speakeasy style bar called Flute in it right now, which is quite quite cute. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what, that is, it, that little block was filled with whorehouses and speakeasies. It was known as sort of the dirtiest block. Most, oh, and, and Arnold Rothstein was shot uh, across the street from Polly's brothel in the Congress apartments, which are still there. Oh, he, he was, I'm sorry, he was not, he was shot in the Park uh, Hotel uh, just up the street and uh, his famous card game that got him shot was right there. So it is really the last of a sort of speakeasy culture right then and there. It was known as a rotten little block. Um, I see somebody in the back, sir. Yes. So the, your question is, did, did she have anything to do with Warm Springs, which is Chris, uh, where uh, FDR uh, was his rehab place that, for, when he, that he established for physical rehabilitation? What's interesting is that um, that was partially how I was able to connect FDR circumstantially to Polly um, when Al Smith is trying to get FDR to run for governor. He needs somebody strong to run for governor while he's running for president in 1928. Um, and so he's trying to recruit him. Uh, Roosevelt says, no, he's down, he's just established Warm Springs, he's got a lot of money on the line, and he's trying to get his legs back so he can be a you know, powerful political presence again. He says, I can't do it, so I got two problems. I got, I got to get my legs back working, and I got to deal with the fact that I have this financial thing that I've invested in. So Al Smith gets two things to solve that. One is he gets J. John J. Roscoff, what's his first name? John Roscoff, John Jake Roscoff. Roscoff, to deal with the money thing. They help fund the, we take that burden off of, of, of Warm Springs off of his head. The other thing is for the legs, he gets Jack Dempsey's trainer to uh, help uh, a guy named Teddy Hayes. Uh, Teddy Hayes is a very close friend of Polly's. Uh, deeply involved, she's deeply involved in the boxing world. Teddy, she tells lots of stories about, about him being in her house. I think that's the connection. That if he, that probably Teddy, and Teddy Hayes goes on to become the right hand man and bag man for um, Ed Flynn of the Bronx, who become the, one of the most powerful political bosses here in New York City. So I think that is probably the connection. That's my, my thought. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Brendan. So, uh, go ahead, go ahead. I guess we're all wondering. So if we were to create a tour based on this book, so I guess that block on 54th would be a perfect location. Yeah. Are there any other locations that you would recommend we incorporate? Second question is you said there was a lot of STD dangers. Did they not have protection during that time? Yeah, two, two very good questions. Uh, Beth Goff has, uh, there's, oh, she, if you stand up, you can see that's her card, that's her, um, card, uh, her business card, um, is that uh, Beth has done, uh, she does a scandalous history tour of the Upper West Side. The Upper West Side tends to be, uh, you know, much more intact. Um, there was a point uh, at which 54th Street, she keeps for a decade, for well, for that's her main spot. Um, but at a certain point, as some of you may know, uh, when prohibition ends, you've got all of these bootleggers who are now out of work because the whole industry has just disappeared and you got all these crim professional criminals with no crime to commit. So kidnapping becomes a huge thing. And so she, um, Jock Whitney says, I can't keep coming to the west side uh, because I'm afraid of being kidnapped. I'll pay for you to move to the east side. Uh, and so she, for many years, was on the east side in Park Avenue. Most of those places don't exist, Madison. And so the west side is quite good. 
I would suggest you're calling, speaking to your uh, your colleague because she's got a beautiful map already right, uh, done up, and she can tell you what's uh, most convenient. The, I will say the last thing about that is the one thing that's a bummer is that because she did not want to be in places, she wanted to be in big, large elevator apartment <laughs> buildings that were not interesting, that could not be identifiable. So they're not really uh, the most interesting places, I would say. Um, on the STD thing, uh, that is ridiculous. I learned more about syphilis than I ever thought I would ever need to know. Uh, if there is one thing I came away with, thank God for penicillin. We live in an age of miracles. Um, not easy. Uh, every, the amount of uh, sexually transmitted diseases was absurd. I mean, absurd. I, you can't even imagine. Condoms, yes, but good luck other than that. Um, John, sorry, I know. I don't, yeah. don't want to. I know, I know you're, you're good. Love the last question from John. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, did, did she, I just curious if she ever ran into Joseph Kennedy, even though he's from a different city. And do you have another project? Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to get a young JFK into her house also. Uh, JFK was a choked. Uh, see the, yes, I spent a bunch of time just looking for people's uh, ugliest habits. Um, he was a choked in the 30s. Uh, the, 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 which is only uh, you know about an hour or so, hour and a half um, out of, if, by train, two hours maybe. Uh, so he would come in with his friend Lem Billings, who was gay uh, actually, and, but they would go to prostitutes up in Harlem. Uh, so I was never, I, it's possible. Um, she catered to a lot of Yale men in particular. Yale and Princeton were kind of her specialties. Uh, she tells one story, because it's very common for men to send their, their sons to uh, lose their virginity so they don't pick up any bad habits. Uh, or get some Italian waitress in New Haven pregnant. Uh, and, uh, and so there's one story she tells about how he says, now he sends his two sons. You go down, you can use my charge account at Polly's anytime. They bring their entire like dorm. And uh, he, the, the, the father is, all right, well this time. But no, I'm not paying for the whole goddamn sex life of Yale University. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you for having me. It was a wonderful audience. Thank you again. Happy birthday, everyone. So um, yeah, that was that was great. I mean, that was really really fun, and I can't wait to read it. I love these kinds of sexy scandalous stories. Yeah. I will say that this book—it's a pretty big book. Is that a paperback now? It's paperback, but it's yeah, no, it's super. I mean, the way she talks is the way she writes. Yeah. It's super breezy. It's an. It's Are you a book coming? Audio, audio work? It is an audio book. Yeah, there is an audio book. Who yes. is it? Future work? Uh, oh, what, what? What? We were having such a nice time. <laughs> 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 uh, great. Yes, well, it is on all, the, all those formats. Be thank great. you. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was really, really a ton of fun. I uh, can't wait. And then we're going to go on Beth's tour. Beth's going to be like, we're going to be bugging you for fams and tours and fams and tours. Yeah, yeah it's going to be great. It's going to be great. All right. Well, thank you, thank you. So we're going to keep um, we're going to keep going. And um, next up is we're going to be talking about our time at IATDG. And of course, Debbie, you're welcome to stay and learn all the business of GANIC if you get overwhelmed with it or tired of it. You know, feel free to. Oh, of course, of course, of course. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But we're going to keep on going. So um, right now, John and I will give our report. From IATDG, which was the, in, which was the International Association of Tour um, Directors and Guides, um, they have an annual meeting called Tour Connect. Um, this year it was just outside of Chicago, the first week of November. Um, and I kind of saw James Mason. Is he here? Where did he go? Um, he sort of saved us all because on election night we're all there, and so he set up a little. Hello. Fortified and fresh uh, refreshments in the lobby, and we all sat there and just stared at MSNBC. But so it was a lot of fun. It's a great, great way to connect. And so what I have here, actually, I have with me is the um, this was the schedule. This was the agenda for the meeting, and I'd be happy to pass this around. So November sixth to the tenth, there's a series of educational sessions throughout the day. But what they also do at IATDG 
is you are able to interview with tour operators, um, which is really um, one of the main reasons for people to go. And John actually interviewed, and we'll be, um, we'll be talking about that. What I did is I went to as many educational sessions as, um, as I could, and I wrote up a, I always take notes, I just can't help it when I'm in a lecture or somewhere, I take the notes, and so I've got them all written up, I've edited them a little bit for clarity and for, um, you know, just to, to, to make them a little easier to read, and, um, and those will be posted in the Gannick documents section. So I have uh, all the different sessions that I went to, and just my notes from the session, so I'm happy to, to share them with everybody. Uh, there were great get-togethers and events with um, with Vaughn and Karen, who are uh, Vaughn is, who started IITDG, and Karen, who's his, basically his right-hand woman, who does everything that Vaughn thinks of. He has these ideas, and Karen's the one who really puts them together. Karen Yates. Um, they planned some really fun get-togethers, some really fun moments um, for all of us to to um, to to get to know each other. And so it's a great way to meet other tour guides from across the country. Great way to get to know tour operators and to connect with them. I personally didn't interview, but did not interview, but I spoke to a lot of tour operators and they're like, oh yeah, if you're interested, you know, we should be in touch. And so it's a really, really a worthy, um, a worthy moment to um, a, a kind of a conference um, to attend. Gannett members who attended, uh, John and I had the Gannett stipend, but other members included Matt Baker, Michael Dillinger, Michael Morgenthal, Cindy Lodopoulos, she was also a panelist, um, Billy Nemec, uh, Jim Carr, who was also representing uh, Washington, D.C., and then we also had Christine um, Lazar, James Musick, Mitch Bach was there too, he's a Gannett member, he's also there for um, trip school, and Richard Beckman, who's a uh, Organic member that um, he's, he's I, haven't, I haven't seen a lot of meetings, so it was nice to see you at um, IITDG. So that was a lot of fun too. So Organic had a really um, a good bunch of people who were there. Um, in terms of the sessions themselves, there's just one thing I want to mention, and actually I'm hoping to get um, to get the speaker to try to organize with the education committee to have a PDP, a professional development program, with Sarah Emhoff, who spoke about um, stress and burnout, and I think you guys who attended the session, it was, really, <clears throat> it was really a lot of fun. It was really a great sort of venting session, a great way to get some little tips. And I, um, and actually I wrote these up for the newsletter as well. But just some ways to help us, you know, when you're getting so stressed out and you're just sort of getting in your head about things and different activities we can do every day to help us out. And one thing that she mentioned that really sort of hit me, especially because also I have, I have young adult, um, children um, is you can tell your brain to that you can do things you know how you just get into that and you're like you're like oh, I can't do this anymore everything sucks you know I'm like you know, my daughter's like oh this is awful she's got her new job she doesn't know what to do my son's like oh, I've got so many classes you just start with the little things and the signs of acknowledgement you're telling your brain that you can do stuff it doesn't have to be something big like I always make myself these lists and I never get through them but when I'm doing my list, I like if I do something, I'll put it on the list and then I'll check it off because I'm like, well, I did that. You know that counts as so even the littlest things like I made my bed, <laughs> I took the dog for a walk, I you know ran a load of laundry. These little kinds of things can help you just realize to yourself that you can do things. So it doesn't have to be, you know, I just spent 13 years and wrote an amazing book. It can be. I got out of bed and I actually, you know, got to the tour, you know, I, things like that that can make you just feel better about yourself. Other tips include creating a playlist of silly, fun things that you can do. And this is good for like student groups. It's like a bonding moment. Have a song or have something that you can do. Say you're on a coach with, um, with students. Um, another uh, way to sort of shift your attitude is instead of complaining about something to um, state things in a, the, using the, um, words like need. You know, saying like, oh, you know, you were late and you can't be late. I don't want you to be late. So, I need you to be on time. I need you to do this for me. You can switch the attitude and um, like, you know, if you have guests who are complaining or people who are being problematic, say, I need you to trust me to take care of the tour. I need you to let me do my work. And so it sort of shifts the attitude and um, shifts the way you think about things. Um, really great tip, of course, be nice to your body. Okay. 
ease up on the sugar and the caffeine and the alcohol if you can, if you need to, you know, you can just take a break, be kind to yourself. A great tip she just said is when you're all worked up, like say you're going to go to a meal and you just kind of grab that quick bite to eat between tours or you're running from one place to another, take three deep breaths and just sort of sit for a moment and you help your body itself relax so you can even digest properly. You know, how many times have you just been like, oh my God, I'm starving and I've got to run and meet the guests somewhere else. Just, and if you're just eating a granola bar, just take a couple breaths, take a moment for yourself, reset yourself and um, you know, it'll help you digest better, which will help you feel better. And then just get somebody you can check in with, get a burnout bodies, buddy, somebody you can, you know, vent with, they can vent with you, can sort of sound things off, just somebody who'll listen to you um, but not just dwelling on the negative, you know, like, like I said, with my kids, you know, my daughter was complaining about this and this. I'm like, there's gotta be five things you did today that, that were, that you actually did. She's like, mm, I don't know. I'm like, did you have breakfast? She's like, yeah. I'm like, well, that counts. Okay. You know, did you make your bed? No. Well, did you, you know, empty the cat box? Yes. Well, that counts, you know, things like that. And then you just feel better. So it's a little silly tips, but I thought that was really useful. So at the sessions, I'll post this to the Gannick documents as part of my report. You all can read through them. Lots of interesting stuff about um, dealing with difficult personalities, um, becoming an international tour guide, um, ways to engage your groups, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, how language matters, um, engaging black and brown students. I'm trying to think of all the other ones I had. Letting go, how to prepare yourself for your next tour, um, things like that. So I've got those, those all will be posted. So John, if you want to come up and give your, your little report. Hi there. So I decided uh, to focus, since I was there as the first time doing interviews, that I would focus on the experience of being there giving, uh, uh, attending interviews and what it was like. And so if anybody would, was thinking of doing it, God, I've heard about this, but I'm not sure it's worth it. Hopefully I can answer that. Now I first want to, I'm going to do, uh, say a couple things first. First of all, um, obviously I'm giving a report as kind of a first time attendee. I know that some of the people here are kind of veterans. So if you want to add anything like perspective, that's more valuable, please do so at the end. I appreciate it. Uh, secondly, uh, I'll, uh, oh, I forgot what second, but anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but, I, but like I said, I, so what I'm gonna do is get it. Now, for, one thing I did was, on, I was, because we don't have visuals, uh, you know, assistance here. I did post on Facebook a, um, a set of photos. This is irritating. I think, I think, she's a, I think you're, maybe you're being the wrong speech. Yeah, um, can people hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so I did post on Facebook, and you can just find this in the Gannick Facebook group, a set of four photos that I took from the conference. This is a picture of the room where the TOs are based. Okay, so it's, it's a room with 50 TOs there. A couple of the ones advertised were not present for various reasons. One of them was caught in bad weather. Like, what, what was it? There was a, one from a state that had had tornadoes, so, or something like that. I can't remember, but so a little bit like that. But there were 50, roughly 50 TOs in the room. Um, this is the room. Then this is a map that we were given that showed where they were to find them. Again, I posted that in the Facebook group with the names of the TOs. And then here's a sample of the schedule I had on one of my interview days. I posted it there. Okay, um, so that what it looked like. This was a screenshot from the thing. Now you had when you go there, uh, you register on their website. You actually become a member of it. Uh, you have to. There's a free membership category. They also have paid membership categories, but I joined as a free member to set up an account. And then I got a dashboard, which had allowed me to set up schedules. So a few days before the conference, uh, they uh, had a list of the TOs that were present. And then what you did was you chose TOs that you would like to have an interview with. I think you were given, you were allowed to rank them in three ways. One, I want to interview them very much. One, I might like to interview them. Those weren't the words, but something like that. And then one that I don't want to interview. You actually selected ones you don't want to interview with. Um, for any reason. Like I, I did, I selected no to anything involving Alaska. I mean, I love Alaska. I, I would hope to go there one day, but I'm not going to give tours there. So, you know, uh, and remember that we are talking about, you know, tour companies operating over the entire, you know, internationally and all over the world. So uh, we're talking quite a bit. So um, I listed the, my preferences. There was a maximum number of ones you could list in certain categories and things like that. So I sent that, and then I was given a schedule, and this is what it looked like. 
okay? And so that um, was my schedule for that. The interviews happened over two days. Um, before the interviews, though, there was a couple of things that they called the perfect pitch. Uh, first of all, all the TOs stood up in front of us, and in just a minute, they kind of pitched their company, okay? Now, remember that we're talking about a lot of companies that offer different you know, types of so many of them are looking for over-the-road guides who are going to travel all over, you know, in, in multiple cities all over the United States. Some of them are looking for international tour guides uh, to go to, you know, internationally, obviously. Uh, and but some of them are offering walking tours that even including uh, walking tours based here in New York, so and and other types. Okay. Um, and obviously, there, you know, I, I use the word tour guide a lot, but we're talking about a mix of people looking for tour guides and tour directors, we should stress. Uh, so that each company gave a pitch. Uh, I actually found that very hard to follow because they didn't give us a list in advance of the companies. I would have liked that because I had a hard time figuring out which company was in it. They, they would say their name at the beginning and then I would never know which company it was if I missed it. So that was a little confusing, but then nevertheless, it was useful. And then all the tour tour uh, attendees, I, I was the attendees I'm gonna say, because again, it's tour guides and tour directors, uh, were given a chance to give their pitch. And so there was a, a time of day when we all uh, kind of lined up and we went around a room, we, uh, we did it six times. We, we stood in front of a table that had about eight tour operators or one of their representatives standing and we gave a one minute pitch of what we can do a one minute pitch. Then you had to go to the next table, give it again, and then you did it six times in total, okay? You were given feedback from uh, each of those, which was quite useful. They would tell you things like, uh, you're, not, you know, you're too nervous. I, I didn't get that. Is that, do I look nervous? <laughs> okay. um, I, uh, you were given feedback like you were too nervous. I heard one person say that he was wearing the wrong shoes. Yeah. Anyway, I, okay. um, I won't, not me, it wasn't me, but yes, you know who I'm talking about. Okay, um, and uh, a few other things. Uh, he actually got, did, had a very successful conference that week, or so, so anyway. Um, the, um, so, so that was that, and then the next day was the interviews. So the interviews uh, were divided into two parts. There was one was the one-on-one -on -one interviews. So those are the, presumably the companies that you really want to work for. Okay, those are the ones you're really shooting for. Uh, and you, you get a one-on-one -on -one interview. It's, they're five minutes long. You basically go from table to table uh, on the schedule. Um, my schedule was not as busy as it might have, could have been. I think I, I could have had more interviews, uh, like physically, but as I said, that's what it's like. Now, the kind of questions that they ask, again, it's only five minutes, so it's a very get to know. Usually they have your resume already there, and by the way, you gotta have loads of resumes for this. I, I printed out 50 and I ran out. Okay, so you need loads of resumes for this. Uh, you. Um, uh, they're, they're, a lot of them are looking for problem solvers. That's one thing that I would say I wasn't as strong with doing in the interviews myself, and I hope I can answer those questions better next time. That uh, a big uh, uh, a big question that was that was like, what would you do if the tour operator uh, doesn't want you to give a tour? You know, like like they take the mic and say, I'm not gonna. You're just gonna sit here. You know, like that was a question that was asked. You know, oh, uh, one of the um, tour operators in a perfect pitch said, I'm looking for people who can solve problems. Because if you try to call me, I'm gonna be in bed sleeping because she's in another country and you know, based in another country and she'll be in a different time zone. So you know, uh, there was a big emphasis on looking for people who are capable of dealing with problems on their own, uh, I would say. Um, so there were questions aimed at that, like uh, what would you do uh, if you ran into a uh, a, a, a client that had 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 a very unsuccessful tour previously, or something like that. Uh, so that a uh, lot of lot of questions like that. Uh, so you should be prepared for things like that. Uh, the next day was the three-on-one interviews. Those are where you're sitting with three fellow tour guides or tour directors who are all you know interviewing with the same company. It's a little more informal. But it's also probably less perspective. Like these are these are the companies that are feeling you out, and then you you're going to be on their might list. You know you you know maybe they'll call you or not. But it's less um, uh, potential that you'll actually get a job. But again, it, it always varies. There. So those are the two main days. I should emphasize that of course 
The interviews are not the only way that you can get work out of this place. There's also just the general schmoozing and you know meeting people and stuff like that. And a lot of people who attend it don't attend the interviews. I mean, you know, like so it should be said that the interviews are not the only way to get maximum value out of it, uh, um, and so on. But nevertheless, it is one of the key things. Okay, I, that's where I'm going to finish. Uh, there. Does anybody have any questions or additional comments? Yes. So on the international. How many languages do you have to speak? How does that work? Well, we, we, were, we actually, I, I attended one of the, uh, the sessions was on internet, was a presentation by, you know, guys, and the, 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 got the direct TD who gave the uh, session said she doesn't give, now remember, this is a tour director, not a tour guide, okay? Um, she does not speak any languages, and she yeah. gives tours in over 50 countries, I think she said. Yeah. Um, but, but she, of course, hires local guides to give uh, yeah. Tours, so that's one of one of the answers. Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind: so the TO tour operator, TD tour director, those are the people you know. You're booking, you're making, checking everybody into the hotel, you're making sure the restaurant reservations. You know, it's a different kind of thing, and then you also have the tour guides, and so depending on what everyone was looking for. So, um, and I think my sheet is going around so you can see the different kind of education panels. Um, any um, other questions for um, any other questions for John? But if you have questions, feel free to shoot us um, emails about that. So we will give you our report. Thank you, John. Um, so uh, moving on, we do need to get to our committee reports.